Hey, well, good evening. What a dramatic way to start our Wednesday night Bible study. And that's because we have a very exciting announcement. We have been waiting for several weeks to come back together. And this coming Sunday, May 31st, we'll be able to meet together for Sunday morning at 11 a.m. And so let's all rejoice together that we'll be able to meet. Uh, now let me explain to you how this is going to work. Instead of a, a light switch where everything comes back on and uh, runs our normal schedule, that's not the way it's going to be. It's going to be more like getting up before sunrise and watching the sun come up slowly. And so Sunday school is still going to be done virtually. So still watch us on Facebook Live for Sunday school. But then at 11 a.m., uh, we'll have our morning worship service. Now, we're going to be sending you some very important communication. We're going to send it via email. We will hard mail a copy to you in the mail so it should arrive in your home before Saturday. We will also post it on our church website. These are the protocols that we have to follow uh, as we come back together. So you cannot miss that out. And what we're requesting is an RSVP so that we'll know how to set up the auditorium. Now, some of you can probably see, I've got a bright little yellow uh, tape measure here on my hip. And what we've done today is we've gone inside and we measured out the auditorium because the state guidelines say only 25% capacity of what your auditorium can hold. So for us, uh, that turns out to be 60 seats. Um, and so before all of this started, some Sundays we were close to 80, uh, sometimes 85 people. And um, so that's a few extra people then that will have to go over to our high school uh, room. And that room will be able to seat 30. So between those two rooms, we'll be able to fit everybody in on Sunday morning. And uh, so there will be no children's church and there won't be a nursery and uh, we will have to social distance and we'll have to wear a face mask, social distance in the parking lot. When you come in, try to leave a space between you and the person that is parked a space away from you. And uh, so Lord willing, we'll see you Sunday morning at 11 a.m. The buildings are being cleaned and we're preparing for that service. So we'll see you then. Now we're gonna do a little bit more informal tonight. So the camera is gonna stay live but uh, it may bump around and you may get to see what pastor's office looks like uh, before I actually sit down in the chair. So stay with us. Give us about 30 seconds to make the transition. Here we go. Okay, so I'll give Morgan just a second to get the camera adjusted here so we can get zoomed in and ready to go. While he's doing that, please take your Bibles, open up to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3 tonight. Matthew chapter 3 is uh, where we're going to be. And I did send the uh, lesson notes along to you via email. So check your email if you want to follow along uh, with the notes that go with this lesson. Uh, but it is lesson 32. And uh, this lesson is about John the Baptist. It's called God Sent John the Baptist to Baptize, and John Baptized Jesus. Now, John the Baptist is uh, an interesting uh, character. He is the last of the prophets, and he's the greatest of the prophets, according to what Jesus said. And uh, we, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the prophecy that uh, the angel uh, gave to John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, that he would be the forerunner of the Messiah to prepare the way of the Lord. So that's where we're going to uh, eventually get to tonight. But let me just ask you some questions. Uh, maybe we can just review some of this from last week. Now, I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of material here tonight in this lesson, and I don't know if we'll be able to get it all in or not. So there might be a part A and a part B uh, to this message. Okay, so what does Emmanuel mean and why 
does it apply to Jesus? Emmanuel means God with us, and that's it applies to Jesus because Jesus is God who came to earth to be born and live as a man amongst us. Uh, which Old Testament prophet prophesied that uh, Jesus would be born in the city of David? Do you remember? And what is the name of that city? All right, it's the Old Testament prophet Micah in the city of Bethlehem. Um, and then Mary asked Jesus at the end of last week's lesson, I'm not sure if I covered this or not, so um, maybe just saying it now is going to be something new. But uh, Mary and uh, Joseph had lost Jesus uh, at the end of the Passover, and they had to go back to the city of Jerusalem to find him. And they found him in the temple having a discussion with the religious teachers of his day, and they were all amazed at his wisdom. I know I covered that part, but Mary asked Jesus, uh, why did you scare your uh, mother and Joseph this way? And Jesus said, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Meaning that he knew that he was the son of God and that his father had sent him here on a mission. All right, so let's jump in here tonight. Uh, Matthew chapter 3. Um, we're going to look here at the teachings of John the Baptist. And in those days came John the Baptist um, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And I need my glasses, and that's why I left them on my shirt so I wouldn't forget them. Ah, this helps. Saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So not one were there only prophecies concerning Jesus as the deliverer or the Messiah. There was a prophecy concerning his forerunner, John the Baptist. And so the quote here says, as the prophet Isaiah said. So I would like to read that quote to you from the Old Testament now, the amazing thing about this is Isaiah lived in the 8th century before Christ, so 700 years before Christ. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, this is going to be the mission of John the Baptist. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So this is the ministry that John would have, is to prepare the hearts of the people or the coming delivered. So he would announce him, he would introduce Jesus as the deliverer to the nation of Israel. So John uh, believed God. That was uh, his message. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John put himself uh, and identified himself with all people that he was a sinner and needed God to send his deliverer to him. And so John believed God. And so John the Baptist had grown into manhood, and it was time for him to begin his ministry. And so uh, this is found here in Matthew chapter 3, verses uh, 1 through 11. But now notice with me in verse 2, uh, it says here, John uh, came preaching, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, what is repentance? Some people think that repentance is making a promise that you'll try to stop sinning and leave your sins behind. But that is not repentance. Biblical repentance is a change of mind about what you think about yourself and you take God's side and recognize or acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you cannot save yourself and that what God has been saying is holy and just and true and that you will uh, recant or repent of your own thinking and believe what God says about you that you're a sinner and you cannot save yourself and you will trust uh, in God uh, for your salvation for the forgiveness of your sins and that is what repentance is about so John came preaching a message of repentance an attitude uh, that one has about himself toward God uh, that he's the only true God and uh, that we can only serve and worship him alone. And uh, so this is repentance. 
that they needed to change. They needed to realize that they had sinned against God by disobeying his laws and they were unable to make themselves acceptable to God. And so this is why he's saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so this attitude about sin is what leads to a change. They need to acknowledge their sin was against God and that since he hates sin, they will deserve his judgment. Now over here I have a visual in the background that Morgan's going to zoom in on here. It's the bottom one. Uh, the definition of repentance. Uh, repentance here is uh, to repent is to agree with God about himself, about ourselves, about our sin. So God is holy, we are not, and uh, that we need to return to, to the Lord. All right, so thank you, Morgan, for zooming in on that. Now let's uh, continue here. So every one of us should agree with God concerning these same truths, that God alone is God, and that he is true and every man is a liar, and we are to worship him alone, and that we cannot make ourselves acceptable to God. And uh, because God is holy, he hates sin, and he cannot overlook our sin. He will never accept even our most sincere efforts to do the right thing. We deserve God's punishment. So John was the one uh, that the prophet Isaiah said would precede the promised deliverer. Now, in uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, I'm going to read to us for a description of uh, John. So the prophet said, This is he who will cry in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. Now listen to how uh, this guy is dressed. Okay, And this same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So he went to the finest tailors uh, on Fifth Avenue on the Upper East Side in New York City and had his custom Italian suit uh, fitted for him uh, with the gold cuff links. And, uh, and he went then to the finest five-star Michelin uh, restaurant to, to have his dinners. Okay? No. Okay? John the Baptist is a very poor man. He has poor man's clothes. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the leather, really, here of, of camel's uh, skin, okay? Uh, camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins. So he just a simple uh, one-piece garment with a leather belt around him. And his food was locusts and wild honeys. Um, so I, I don't know. Honey's a pretty good thing. But I just don't think I'm quite into the protein diet of wild locusts. I mean, you can even cover them in chocolate. And I'm probably not going to go for it if you tell me what's underneath of it. Okay. And so, you know, we, we have such a misconception today that God will save us and make us rich and make us wealthy. I listened to the, one of the famous tele-evangelists, um, and his whole sermon was, you need to have more faith. You need to have a bigger frying pan so God can fill it with more and more. And if you just have faith to have a bigger frying pan, then God will just keep increasing the size of your frying pan and keep filling it. And it's like as God is a cosmic bellboy, we ring the bell and God comes running to make us healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. Um, folks, that's known as the prosperity gospel, and it's heresy. It's wrong. Uh, Jesus Christ himself had nowhere to lay his head. The, the birds of the air have nests, and the foxes of the earth have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Um, the gospel is not about repenting to become wealthy. Uh, forget that. Okay, so that was just a, a little discursus, uh, discursus there. But um, John believed God and was appointed to be his messenger, okay? Um, so John, like many of those who follow God, have been very poor. And uh, so Jesus, even God's own son, was poor. Now, let's look at the message that John is preaching and see what the people do. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around Jordan, and were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So when they heard John the Baptist preaching, 
repent ye. They did respond positively to the prophet's message. They acknowledged that they were sinners, that they could not save themselves. They changed their mind about themselves, about God and their own sins. They agreed that they could not save themselves, and they depended then upon the coming deliverer to save them from their sins. And so John's ministry is to introduce the deliverer to them. And so he's preparing the people's hearts so that when they see Jesus, they'll recognize him as Messiah. They will uh, listen to him and listen to his preaching. So the people were repenting, and then they were following that repentance up with an evidence or a symbol of their repentance. Well, what is that? Well, verse 5 says they uh, went out uh, to him in verse 6, and they were baptized of him in the Jordan. And so baptism is an outward symbol of the inward heart attitude change that has taken place. That we recognize we're sinners. We cannot save ourselves. We ask God to save us, to justify us. And then in doing that, then we can be baptized. But water baptism without repentance, that's just getting wet. All right, It doesn't do any good. Uh, why does baptism not? do any good why can't baptism save us you know there are some churches that teach that baptism saves and that's called baptismal regeneration that you're regenerated or made new in God's sight through water baptism but that can't be because only death could pay for our sins only the death of Jesus Christ not our own religious efforts and so many of the Jews repented that when they heard what John had told them and John told them then to show that repentance and be baptized. So they demonstrated that they had accepted John's message of repentance. And so baptism in itself didn't make them acceptable to God. And it doesn't make anybody acceptable to God. All right. So then John had a confrontation with the religious teachers of his day. So let's look here at Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. When, when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say unto you that God is able to raise up of these stones children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the roots of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wow. John was a fiery preacher. He sees the religious leaders of his days. There are two different sects of religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in a resurrection. They believed in angels and miracles. Uh, the Sadducees were the liberals, kind of like liberals today. They denied the miraculous. They denied angels. Uh, they died, denied uh, the resurrection. And so those were the, the two ruling classes that came out to John. And uh, John just let them have it. Listen, you bunch of snakes, okay? Who's warned you? You need to flee from the wrath of, of God that is coming. Uh, you need to change your lives. You need to show the evidence of true repentance. And uh, so he says, bring forth fruit that is meat for repentance. The word meat means that is fitting or becoming of repentance. Have the demonstration of a changed life. And so John addressed the proud, unrepentant religious leaders of his day. And so the Pharisees and the Sadducees were very proud, but John rebuked them. And so uh, he rebuked them all. All right. Uh, they followed their own ideas and not the scriptures. And so John had to rebuke them. All right. So it's, uh, we've been going for about uh, 23, 24 minutes. So I think we're going to probably go maybe six or seven. And then uh, we might end up with part B on this because I think I've got several more pages to go here yet. Yeah, I've got three or four. So... Um, we might have part B in this tonight. But let's just keep going with what we've got.
And so John spoke very boldly to the Pharisees and Sadducees because they were so arrogant. And so in verse 7 again, um, so he's telling them, um, O generation of viper who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So God is against the proud and he helps the humble. James uh, tells us in his epistle that God resists the proud but gives grace unto the humble. Uh, you remember some people that had stubborn pride in the Old Testament? Uh, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, was stubborn and proud, and God resisted him and, and brought him down. Um, and so God asked the question to Pharaoh, how long will you refuse to humble yourself uh, before me? And so God resists self-righteous, arrogant people. And so, but it says this, but he gives grace to the humble. If we will humble ourselves and, and agree with God that we're sinners and take God's side, that what he's been saying is holy, perfect, true, and just, and then agree about our sins and call on God, then he will forgive us of our sins because he gives grace to the humble. Grace is God's undeserved favor. You see, there, there's a difference here with this word grace. There, there is a false religious cult out there that in their book says, for by grace are you saved after all you have done. So imagine a, a bar uh, chart here. And in their column, shade in maybe 7%, shade in 27%, shade in 77% of self-effort, self-righteousness. And whatever you fall short, then God just makes up the difference. All right, That's their definition of grace. God's definition of grace in the holy word of God is Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, zero effort. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works. This other bar chart over here, okay? Not as a result of works, lest anyone should boast. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So grace is God's unmerited favor. It's not earned or deserved in any way. Now, John told the Pharisees and Sadducees that if they repented and believed God, it would be evidenced in a change in how they lived. Now, sometimes when somebody truly has repented and put their faith and trust in Jesus, people will say, oh, so-and-so got religion, and he won't come to the bar anymore. She won't go out to uh, clubbing anymore, okay? Or they're not doing drugs anymore. And so they know that their life has changed and they attribute that to finding religion. But what they really entered into is a repentance towards God that resulted in salvation from Jesus through faith. And it changed their life. And one of the, of course, the biggest criticisms that uh, religious people have is the hypocrisy. And even the world knows that repentance should bring forth the change. It should have some evidence. And this is what John is telling the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And um, they were really proud that they were descendants of Abraham. And so they were, they were counting on their, um, I guess, their religious pedigree. Okay, And they were saying, well, we were born okay with God because we've got Abraham as our father. Uh, that's like some people saying, well, I was born a Christian, I was baptized as a baby, and as far as I can remember, my family has always been Christian. Uh, that doesn't cut it with God. Okay? And so this is what the Pharisees and Sadducees were trying to use with John the Baptist. Uh, well, we're okay with God because we're born Jews, and Abraham is our father. Uh, notice what John the Baptist said to them. Um, do not think to say within yourselves, we have Abraham uh, to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to raise up of these stones uh, children unto Abraham. Hey, listen, th that's self-righteous thinking. Uh, God can take a rock and turn it into a child. I mean, after all, what is man? <laughs> Man's dust of the earth, right? 
So if God wanted to, he could breathe life into a rock and make it a living being and raise up sons to Abraham. Uh, don't think that your religious uh, activities, uh, being a Baptist, is not going to save you, a Presbyterian, a Catholic, a Mormon, uh, a Buddhist, none of that is going to save you. Uh, none of the, your religious pedigree, your heritage, your tradition is going to save you. And you need to realize that. And so they needed to repent just like all the other people that they were calling sinners. And so some people today think that they're automatically accepted by God because of other people's faith or other people's holiness. Now, this is incorrect thinking. Why? Well, because God does not accept you based in group mentality. God judges you individually. The soul that sins, it shall die. The fa God will not visit the sins of the Father upon the sons, nor the sins of the sons upon the Father. Um, so there's not a group judgment here. God judges you individually as a person. Now listen to the warning that Jesus was giving to the Pharisees. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, uh, every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Um, the axe is laid to the roots. The whole tree has got to come out. It, it's no good. There's not any fruit. There's no change. There's no evidence of repentance. And without repentance, then we are led to everlasting judgment. There's going to be a burning flame. There's a fire that is a consuming fire and is cast into the fire. And so John the Baptist was warning the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, the religious leaders of his days, look, unless you repent, you're going to be judged by God and you're going to be cast into the fire. And so uh, no one is going to enter heaven on the reputation of someone that they think may have influence with God. Uh, neither our family ties nor our religious affiliation can make us acceptable to God. And so instead of these things, um, who uh, or what does God say that he will judge us by? And so with that, we'll end with that question. We'll come back next week with part two. All right, please remember uh, to do this for me tonight. Hey, would you do this? Hit one of the emotion icons in there. Hit the wow face or, you know, the group hug thing in this. We're all in this COVID-19 thing together. Or give me a thumbs up or a smiley face, something like that. Uh, tell me what your favorite Bible story is. And I'll, I'll tell you why I'm asking you to do this. Uh, this last week, the Sunday night message was shared seven times and uh, that has yielded over a thousand, I think it was 1,200 different views this week. And uh, it's because we took the time to comment and share on it. So uh, Calvary people and those that are watching later on the rebroadcast of this, please uh, like the page, uh, comment, uh, like, or share it. Start a watch party, but get the Word of God out there. We'll see you Sunday school. Sunday at 9.45 and then in person for the morning worship service at 11. God be with you.